You know, real-time strategy is a genre with a special place in the hearts of PC gamers. But how did it start? How did it become popular? And why has it faded in recent years? I'm going to provide answers to all of those questions. There is a lot to dig into with this topic, however, so I'm going to break this video into a few installments. This first one is going to start at, well, the start. We're going to talk about the secret history of the very beginning of the real-time strategy genre. Let's dig into it. The very first issue of Computer Gaming World, published in the winter of 1981, begins with an article titled The Future of Computer Wargaming by game designer Chris Crawford, who is best known for earlier hit war games like Eastern Front 1941 and the geopolitical strategy game Balance of Power. He details five ways the never-before-seen capabilities of advanced personal computers will change games forever. All his points were prophetic, but one is particularly important the invention and rise of real-time play on home computers. Real-time play was the cornerstone of arcades, of course, where players could already pop in a coin for several action-packed minutes. War games, which at the time were synonymous with strategy games, had yet to embrace that trend, instead porting the turn-based, rules-heavy design of board games to computers. Crawford knew this turn-based tradition was bound to change. His 1981 article said that, quote, Real-time play is both more realistic and more challenging than turn sequence play. It directly solves the problem of simultaneous movement that has never been adequately solved with board games. It also provides a reasonable and realistic simulation of tactical combat. Now, you don't need to play a 40-year-old war game to understand what Crawford is describing. I'm sure you've at some point found yourself sitting around a board game, whether it's Monopoly, Settlers of Catan, or Scythe, and getting a little bored. The slow pace gives you time to strategize, socialize, or grab another beer, but these positive side effects aren't really part of the game's design. Still, early PC game designers often stuck with tried and true turn-based design. Experimenting with real-time play was risky, and to make it worse, early computers, whether it be an Atari 400 or an Apple II, were ridiculously limited in both performance and memory. Computer games were so rudimentary that games could be shared not just on a disc or cartridge, but as lines of code printed in magazines or books, which players could then just type into their computer. Even simple turn-based games could take minutes to complete a turn. A review of Torpedo Fire, a turn-based submarine war game for the Apple II published by SSI, noted that turns could take more than a minute to resolve and at times drag on for seven minutes. Yet some bold developers took a gamble on real-time strategy. Among the first was Sea Battle, designed by Ken Smith for Mattel's Intellivision in 1980. This two-player game pit opposing fleets in real-time maneuvering and combat on a static map. It included just a few unit types, a single map, and players could only control one fleet at a time. Still, it's undeniably a strategy game. Another take on the idea, again released for Intellivision, was 1981's Utopia. Designed by Don Daglo, this competitive RTS placed each player in charge of an island. Players could develop the island by building farms, schools, and hospitals, as well as deploy fishing boats. Instead of deploying armies, players could hamper their opponent through sabotage. The player with the highest score at the end of the round won. Both games did have some pretty major limitations. There's no AI opponent, so head-to-head -head play was the only option. Players controlled the games by moving a single cursor, and units not directly under the player's control did little or nothing. Chris Crawford brought the ideas discussed in his 1981 article to life the following year with Legionnaire, a game for the Atari 400 and 800, Commodore 64, and Apple II. The game pit Romans and Barbarians in real-time strategic combat across a large map. Legionnaire's greatest innovation was its AI opponent, a first for the genre. Real-time strategy took a huge step forward with the fall 1983 release of Combat Leader, designed by David Hill and published by SSI for Atari 8-bit systems. A tactical game set in World War II, Combat Leader gave players a large roster of units, complex terrain, an AI opponent, and the option to create custom scenarios. And while its graphics seem rudimentary today, its visuals earned high praise from reviewers at the time. Another similar title was NATO Commander, published by Microprose for the same Atari systems. Although its impact at the time was maybe a bit blunted by Combat Leader getting out of the door first, it has the distinction of being designed by Sid Meier, and in fact, it was his first crack at designing a strategy title. 
Meyer later reworked the game for the Command series, three games based on the same real-time engine. These were Crusading Europe, Conflict in Vietnam, and Decision in the Desert. They received mixed to positive reviews, but Meyer apparently wasn't satisfied with them, remarking in his memoir that the games, quote, provided a solid simulation experience and profound historical lessons, but I don't think they necessarily counted as games. 1984's The Ancient Art of War, designed by Dave and Barry Murray and published by Broderbund Software for Apple II and MS-DOS, is a real knockout title that better stands up to modern eyes. The simplistic, blocky graphics of earlier games are replaced by art that more obviously depicts soldiers, forts, and mountains, and battles occur in separate views that put you close to the action, though the player has no direct control aside from setting formations. Gameplay was innovative as well. Combat Leader and NATO Commander were real-time games, but still had one foot firmly planted in the legacy of tabletop wargaming. The Ancient Art of War uses the computer's graphical and processing might to better obscure the rules. Players can easily guess that grasslands offer the fastest movement, while hilly terrain is great for defense without glancing at the manual. The Ancient Art of War is the first real-time strategy game with most of the features recognizable in later games. Players managed multiple squads and could attach or detach units to them. The game included three unit types to create a rock-paper-scissors balance. The game had multiple maps and a game generator for custom scenarios. It had an AI opponent with eight different leaders such as Caesar and Genghis Khan and the game had basic resource management in the form of villages and forts, which generated food to supply and reinforce your squads. The Ancient Art of War was very successful at the time and received excellent reviews. However, Broderbund took its time putting out sequels, and once they arrived, they didn't evolve the game in the direction that later real-time strategy games would follow. 1987's The Ancient Art of War at Sea took the basic concepts of its predecessor, but then applied them to naval combat. It focused so much on the complexity of naval combat, in fact, that it feels more like a real-time tactical game rather than a modern real-time strategy game. 1993's The Ancient Art of War in the Skies, meanwhile, applies real-time strategy concepts to large-scale air combat. It's a very unique title. Few games have ever focused solely on the logistics of running an air force, but six years had passed between it and The Ancient Art of War at Sea, and the market for strategy games was almost unrecognizable from that of the 1980s. Now we come to the game that you'll most often see when you Google what was the first RTS game, Herzog Vi. Apologies if I'm butchering the name, I did a bit of research trying to figure out the most accurate way to pronounce it, but that is what I settled on and that's what I'm going to go with. Developed by Technosoft and released for the Sega Genesis, the game hit Japan in December of 1989, followed by a North American launch in 1990. Erzog Vai is a sequel to 1988's Erzog, a game that pioneered concepts refined in its successor. The lack of buzz about the original is no doubt due to its launch on several computers sold only in the Japanese market, like the MSX and Sharp X1. As far as I know, the original Erzog was never released for any other market and has never been remastered, though you can play it today through emulation. The Erzog games crossed the popular scrolling 2D shooter genre with basic unit and base management. Players control only one unit, a giant mech that can fly across the map. It transforms into a jet in Herzog Vi, but simply hovers in the original. However, this mech can pick up units that spawn from buildings you control. And in that way, it sort of works like later real-time strategy games, only your cursor is a unit and not, well, a cursor. In retrospect, it is pretty easy to make a connection between Erzog and the real-time strategy games that would follow in the 1990s. Erzog Vi's colorful 2D graphics certainly look a lot like early real-time strategy games, and its frantic pace recalls the intense micromanagement of later real-time strategy titles. But claims of Erzog Vi's influence are, I think, a bit overblown. Also, Erzog Vi is not mentioned in the articles published about early real-time strategy games, and I think that is very telling. Claims of Herzog Vi's influence are, I think, rooted largely in statements from Stephen Clark Wilson, who was Virgin Interactive's Vice President of Worldwide Product Development from 1990 to 1994. In 1998, he wrote a post on his personal website claiming to have told Westwood to knock off Herzog Vi for Dune 2, further saying, quote, is it possible that yours truly, by suggesting that Westwood knock off the gameplay in Herzog Vi, created a revolution in computer gaming that is rolling on today? 
I think the answer to that very rhetorical question is no. To be honest, I don't take much stock in his claim for two reasons. First, as a VP at Virgin Interactive, which at the time was Westwood's publisher, he had minimal input into game development. Perhaps he'd mentioned Herzog Vi, but he certainly was not involved with the day-to-day -day of game design in Dune 2 or any later Westwood title. In addition to that, Brett Sperry, the producer on Dune 2, has contradicted Clark Wilson in later interviews. In 2001, in a piece for GameSpot, he said, quote, some of my peers thought Herzog Vi was an influence on Dune 2. That's a compliment. However, the games that helped trigger the genesis of my RTS concept were Eye of the Beholder and its forefather, Dungeon Master by FTL. In 2008, Sperry told Edge Magazine that, quote, the inspiration for Dune 2 was partly from Populous, partly from my work on Eye of Beholder, and the final and perhaps most crucial part came from an argument I once had with Chuck Kogel, the vice president of Strategic Simulations Incorporated. Sperry has also, oddly enough, credited the Mac UI as an inspiration. One of the games Sperry mentioned is, I think, deserving of far more recognition than Herzog Vi, and that game is Populous, developed by newly founded studio Bullfrog Productions and published by Electronic Arts. Populous was the star of the loosely defined God game genre. It cast players as a deity in a struggle to overcome an opposing god. In contrast to later RTS titles, Populous gave players mostly indirect control of their fate. Instead of building armies and ordering them directly to invade, players used the awesome power of a god to clear land for followers to build on, or strike opposing followers dead with righteous fury. The goal was to help your followers help themselves. Despite that, Populous has a lot in common with later RTS games. Released originally on the Amiga, the game was designed for mouse and keyboard from the start and includes a button-heavy interface complete with minimap that later RTS titles would adopt and refine. Also, the game's isometric 2D viewpoint, which offers a sense of three-dimensional depth without the use of real 3D graphics, would become the genre's gold standard throughout the mid-1990s. Unlike Herzog Vi, Populous sold extremely well, and it was absolutely showered with awards. Gamers frantically bought over a million copies in the game's first year on the market, an absolutely massive number for a title released on the Amiga in 1989. Populous also put Bullfrog Productions on the map and made one of its designers, Peter Molyneux, a member of PC Gaming Royalty, giving instant credibility to every project he touched throughout the 1990s. Today, Molyneux is a controversial figure due to the problems surrounding some Kickstarters that he has been involved in. In the 1990s, however, he was basically on the level with Sid Meier and John Romero. A lot of that credibility came from the success of Populous. Molyneux was also involved with some later games that were actually in the real-time strategy genre, such as Gene Wars, but these titles never quite matched the popularity of the Populous series. Populous was followed in 1990 by Powermonger, a more traditional war game set in a fictional medieval setting. In a stunning move for the time, it introduced fully 3D terrain, though units and buildings were still 2D sprites. Indirect control remained the focus, however this time, players channeled their will through captains instead of through a divine power. The Populous franchise received a proper sequel with Populous 2, Trials of the Olympian Gods, which was introduced in November of 1991. Most fans of the Populous franchise do cite Populous 2 as the most impressive game in the series. Now, while Populous 2 did not sell as well as the original, it was still an extremely influential franchise. In fact, Populous 2 would go on to sell more copies than early real-time strategy games like Dune 2 and Warcraft, so although it's not remembered as well as those games today, it actually had more clout at the time. By the end of 1991, with the release of Populous 2 now in the rearview mirror, real-time strategy gaming was ready for its next big thing. The early 1990s were a time of incredible and rapid change in the PC market. The number of households in the United States with a home computer would more than double between 1990 and 1995. Early online services like America Online would become household names during this period. And operating systems with a graphical user interface would go from a rare luxury to a common must-have. These innovations made faster, more complex games possible, and Westwood Studios was about to show the way forward with 1992's release of Dune 2. But I'll have to save that story for the next installment of this series. When it's published, 
I'll leave a link somewhere around here. I'd also like to shout out a few sources. Props to High Retro Game Lord and Major Thriftwood. These are two YouTube channels that focus on raw footage of video game playthroughs. They do a ton of old games. You should definitely subscribe to them if you're interested in video game history. I'd also like to cite Sid Meier's memoir, which is now available at pretty much all major booksellers. Sid Meier is not known for real-time strategy games, but his designs were really influential, particularly in the late 80s and 1990s, so there is a lot there that's relevant. Of course, if you like this video, give it a like. And if you loved it, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on part two and part three of this series. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.